Welcome back, everybody, to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. On this episode, it is Led Zeppelin IV, also known as Zozo, album retrospective. Get ready to rock out with your talk out. It's the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. All right, everybody, and the sound of the music means the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus is in progress. Coming at you live on Rock Rage Radio, three channels on freaking Facebook and YouTube. If you're missing out on all the fun, you want to know how to get on it, you want to go to Lou lombardi rocks.com you get all the info right there it'll show you how to get in, uh get these live streams and hang out with us get on get on the list uh on this week's ludini rock and roll circus podcast we are going to take a step back in time and explore one of the most important albums in rock history led zeppelin 4 more commonly known as zozo was a watershed moment not only for the band but for rock music and rock history with songs like black dog Rock and Roll, and Stairway to Freaking Heaven, uh, this album joins the pantheon of the greatest rock albums of all time, right up there with Dark Side of the Moon and Sgt. Pepper's. So we proudly present tonight Led Zeppelin IV with Lily V6. What's up? And Keith the Hawk Hawkins. Good evening. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, those of you who are listening to Rock Rage Radio, we do appreciate it. Uh, please uh, share the podcast. You can, with whatever mobile device you're on, you know there's always a little share button. Just click that and share it. If you're listening to this uh, replay somewhere, again, share it. If you're listening to it live right now, please share it. Let all your friends know that we're talking about one of the most important things that ever happened in music. Last week, we celebrated the life of Eddie Van Halen, another very important thing that happened in music. I feel like we're just having one epic uh, week after another here with the with the music at the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. But please hit that share button. If you want to get more uh, information on us, go to lulombardirocks.com. Um, and if you love Rock Rage Radio, hey man, rockrageradio.com. Check it out. Get the app. You can listen to great guitar-driven rock 24-7. And of course, a shout out to our good friends at Wolf's Customs. We're going to get a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit more detail about Wolf's Customs later on, but Chris Thunderwolf Dotson's been a longtime supporter of the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. I know he's a Zeppelin fan, and I know he does amazing custom work on guitars and all kind of musical instruments, specifically hollow flashing, but a lot of other really cool uh, custom finishes. So get out there, guys. Rock out like Jimmy Page. Get yourself custom uh, uh, paint job on your musical instrument at wolfscustoms.online. All right, guys. What is... How's everybody doing? Oh, I'm hungover. What? <laughs> you don't drink, do you? I never. What? Never do I Lily drink. Lily doesn't drink. Did you hear that, Keith? Do you believe Lily drinks? Terrible. <laughs> I hung out with my friend Sissy from Metal Chick Jewelry last night, and we had a few too many drinks, and there's that. Is there really such thing as too many drinks? There is. <laughs> I find it yeah, all the time. That can, can be a judge. That's definitely a witness to that because I've seen myself have too many drinks many times <laughs> and still not still not be satisfied like the glutton that I am. <laughs> what are you drinking tonight, Hawk? Tonight I'm drinking, get ready for this now, I'm drinking Bombay Sapphire Gin. Oh. Woo! Mixing it up. Fancy. I thought you were going to say something really like frou-frou. Like, you know, you were having um, da- daiquiris or something. Or margarita. I like daiquiris. I like daiquiris. I haven't had. I do, a... I do like a, I'll do a strawberry daiquiri once in a while. It's like a mango daiquiri or something. Depends on the flavor, but strawberry and mango, I definitely could. I could throw down a couple of them. Yeah, for when sure. When I'm feeling bougie, I like pineapple cosmopolitans. Bougie. Yeah. <laughs> bougie. Bougie woo. We're going to be talking about that bougie woogie music. I had. What did I drink this weekend? I had. I've been on a Moscow mule kick. <sighs> I like and them, I, but I don't and, them. And you know why? Because of you, Hawk. And, very and, awesome, and, very awesome drink. We had a good time drinking Moscow Mules in your uh, in your kitchen there that one night. Um, it was a lot of fun. So I just was uh, so I was celebrating the hawk. He didn't even know it on Sunday, and I was drinking <laughs> some Moscow Mules. I played there a game with go. Mark uh, Shuttleworth out at the uh, Harmony Inn um, Brewery, uh, not brewery, winery. 
brewery, place. whatever, same thing, same difference. It's all alcohol. It's all alcohol. So uh, in the yeah, end, yeah, 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 yeah. So so yes, I mean, I had a few of those, and uh, yeah, I don't drink too much stuff like that. I'm usually, you know, give me give me my whiskey, give me right. my bourbon, you know. <laughs> so. Anyways, guys, we are, and I'm sure, I'm sure the audience is going like, when are they going to talk about Led Zeppelin? That's the only reason I tuned in. Okay, we're going to talk about Led Zeppelin. Calm down. They don't care about us. All they want to hear about is the real dirt one with, with Led Zeppelin 4. I mean, you know, well, there's us, though. There's no reason for them they to don't think care about, about Led Zeppelin. They don't care about the drinking habits of free people. They, don't, they just don't care about it. <laughs> Not unless they get to join in on the drinking habits. Uh, so we're gonna do we're gonna do all the all the as Lily would say we're gonna do all the things that we are going to rank the tracks. Oh so boy! So get ready at some point. Get your fit. I need thinking a pen. About, <laughs> Be thinking about how y'all want to do it. Uh, it's right there. I see it. I see it. I can see I a pen. See it. Okay. Up. Oh, that might not work. This is what I'm oh, that's it's good. It's working. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. All right, Keith. Uh, Keith, you have your uh, you have your. Uh, Special Led what? Zeppelin rank uh, song list ranking pen ready. I already did that shit, man. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna get into that a little bit later on. But can, let's get a general. Let's have Lily give us a sort of general uh, background on this record. This is indeed Led Zeppelin's fourth album, correct? Yes. Okay. So go ahead. <laughs> Technically untitled fourth studio album by Zeppelin, commonly known as, known as Led Zeppelin Four, or people call it Zoso as well. Released November 1971. Produced by Jimmy Page, uh, recorded in uh, the country house Headley Grange, um, which is a place who, where a lot of artists recorded their albums like uh, Bad Company, Fleetwood Mac, Genesis, a whole bunch of others. Um, it is notable for featuring Stairway to Heaven, which is one of the band's signature songs. Um, after the band's Led Zeppelin three kind of received like blah Right. Reviews from critics, they decided their fourth album would be officially untitled and would be represented instead by four symbols, which we'll talk about later, chosen by each band member without featuring the name or any other details on the cover. Um, there are some guest musicians on the album, and uh, most of the material was written by the band. Uh, there is one cover song um, at the very end, which is when the levee breaks. Uh, huge success. This album was a huge commercial and critical success. Best-selling album by far uh, by the band with 37 million copies. And it is one of the best-selling albums in the United States. And it is on the greatest albums list, uh, greatest albums of all time list. Wow. Yeah. Imagine that and, and imagine that. So, how do we want to approach, guys? Do we want to go song by song and talk about track by track? Is that how we want to do it? That's how we usually yeah, let's let, do that. With that let's huh? start at the beginning then. Let's start at the very beginning. And Keith, how does this yeah. record start? It starts with a little number called Black Dog. If you don't know the song, you should listen to it. Because it, it is a great piece of work. And this is one of them songs that I don't know how much they played live in their catalog. Because it's just a difficult song to get a hold of. If you ever try to play it in a band, you know that the timing of it is just a little bit off at times. And there's definitely some interesting little structural things about it but the song itself is is a kick-ass song but it's like i said it's one of them songs that just has a uh, a certain vibe to it but I'm, I'm sure it took them a little while to get a hold of it but i mean yeah once they did it it was a mass it's a masterpiece song and it's a great rock and roll song you know it's just, and it's a great way to kick off the album i think that looking through the other tracks there's probably maybe another track i would think of maybe rock and roll would be a good intro because it has like the great drum intro but this song is definitely uh a good one to start the album off with. I mean, this is, you know, this, like we've mentioned before, this album is probably top five for me of all time. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to pick a bad tune on it, but if, if I have to, I mean, but this song is one of those ones that's just going to be on there on the list of great, I think it's one of the great rock songs, you know, not just by Led Zeppelin, but it's a great rock song period, man. It's been covered by many bands and it's just a good song. And, as you know, definitely the radio friendly approach with a kick ass rock and roll vibe. I mean, what else? What else do you want if you're a band? You know, um, what's something? Something I did not. Uh, the band Fleetwood Mac figures on a couple of counts in mm-hmm. the making of this album, which I was surprised to find out doing my research today. But I don't know if you found out this, but the reason they do the stops and, you know, they stop and Robert, they play the riff and Robert sings and then they play the riff and Robert sings. That was inspired by Oh Well by Fleetwood Mac. They were big fans of that song. They loved that song. And um, that is why the song was structured 
like that. Lily, would you got some info on this song? Um, well, Keith was saying uh, about how often they play it. It is a staple at their, li- or was a staple at their live shows, uh, and a fan favorite. Also named after a dog that hung around the Headley Grange during recording. So that is where they came up with that. And um, the uh, riff was composed by um, John Paul Jones. A lot of people don't realize that. There's not a Jimmy Page riff. Um, and it was inspired by a, um, as well as the Fleetwood Mac, oh well, it was inspired as well by a uh, by a, him devouring a lot of Howling Wolf uh, music. Which, you know, if everybody, what a lot of people don't realize about, forget about Led Zeppelin sometimes. It's like, these guys were really steeped in early rock and blues. And that's going to factor in a little bit more when we talk about the next song um, here in a second. But yes, um, Fleetwood Mac uh, inspired the song. The other reason why um, Fleetwood Mac figures in the making of this album was it was Peter Green and company that you know told the boys, "Hey, why don't you guys go out to like the country somewhere and record a record?" Like I think that that would be a really good idea. So this that was the suggestion that was given to them, and it was Andy Johns, their producer, who had worked with the Rolling Stones um, mobile recording unit because they, originally they were going to rent the Stones something or other yeah. but they, they ended up not doing that um, they said you know Matt Fleetwood Mac had recommend they go out in the woods out, out to some you know so they found Headley Grange haunted a little you know so it's Halloween time as we're talking about yeah that's it up. I've heard that too I also think that that don't uh, after reading an interview with Jimmy Page this whole album wasn't recorded at Headley Grange a lot of it was but there was some other like Sneaking in some, t- sneaking into some other studios when you got a chance. Yeah, of course, and doing some tracks. I mean, Heavy Grange gave them that big ass drum sound they were looking for. Because I mean, it's you know bas- basically a big ass you know not a castle but a massive house in the country where you can get a lot of just interesting sounds, a lot of reverb and just like and we're going to cool, talk about the, the last song you know, we're going to talk about is going to work. It's going to fact yeah, that's so, going mean, to be important. That's, that's the thing where they they did sneak in, but Heavy Grange gets the the uh, the uh, gets all the you know vibe about the, the recording but they definitely want some uh they wanted some other places to do so that's you know yeah uh let's get it this this album keith you and i've talked about this many times this album has not only one of the greatest drum intros in all of music but it actually has two of the greatest drum intros in all of music and the first one is on the next very next song we're going to talk about and that is rock Either. and roll by led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah that's an amazing drum intro it is a ripoff. <laughs> I'm just being honest. John Bonham is my favorite rocket. I think he's the greatest rock and roll drummer of all time. He lifted that. Oh, I mean, it's not note for note, but as if you go listen, go when you get off your shift on the podcast, go and pull up the song uh, "Keep It Knocking" by Little Richard and tell me that's not the same drum intro. Okay. Do you know uh, why they wrote rock and roll? Because they were actually jamming um, the one of the guest musicians. Who's the guest musician on this? Ian Stewart. Ian Stewart on piano. They were jamming that song by Little Richard. That is why go. rock and roll sounds the way it does and why uh, John Bonham played that. They, what a lot of people forget about Led Zeppelin is these guys were in their 20s in the 60s, right. which means that they grew up listening to music of the fifties, the so early, they, early, yeah. Oh, so yeah. they, so they know all. They knew all the. Um, in addition to the blues guys, the chess guys, they knew all of those. Um, you know, the, the Elvis and the and the Little Richards and the Chuck Berry. Oh, they they were, loved that yeah, they, stuff. They were all. They were down with that shit completely. I mean, Bonzo himself listened to a lot of jazz and listened to a lot of different. You know styles of music he really liked motown and he was all over the board with his taste it wasn't just like i mean he was definitely a hard-hitting rock rock and roll drummer but he uh he listened to a lot of different kinds of music and i think that it, later on it shows in his playing i mean throughout their whole catalog that he has a lot of influences outside of just being a like a you know kind of a bash rock and roll guy he can he has some touch on a lot of the later tracks you know he does yeah so, um, Lily, do you have a little any background or anything you want to talk about? Um, on this? All I have, besides what you guys already talked about, it took 15 minutes to write the song. <laughs> um, usually performed as the opening or encore of, a, of one of their shows. I was fortunate enough to see some of these songs live. Obviously, I'm too young to have seen them when they were out playing all the time, but I saw Page and Plant played a lot of these songs. So You saw Page and Plant? Yeah, you, 1998. Did you, did you see Page and Plant? Kate? Nah. 
No. That was one of my very first concerts. I spent all of my money to go see them, and it was amazing since it was all, almost all the band members, and it was just great to see. So this is one of the ones I saw, um, and this one is based on the rock and roll three chord song, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> this was um, uh, also a, fav- a favorite of the band Heart. And Hart Ooh. often closed their shows. She does with um, with this with this song. Um, yeah, and, yeah, I've heard them do a lot of Zeppelin stuff in there. They kill it every time. Yeah. So. And there's a fa- there's a funny story that I heard uh, Ann Wilson tell on the uh, on the, the King Biscuit Flower Hour <laughs> many many years ago, saying that they, they <laughs> did not know that Robert Plant was in the audience. Mm. And they came back, they got off stage, and there was Robert. They'd never. It was the first time they ever met him, and you know, and he had this look on his face, and he said, to, "He says to Anne, he says, I didn't sing it in that key, did I?'" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a little bit of fun uh, rock and roll trivia, literally rock and roll trivia. Yes, inspired by um, uh, 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 what's what song again? Keep a knocking. Yeah, keep keep a knock. Keep a knock by, by Little Richard. By yeah. Little Richard, yeah. Which, uh, and and I and I think you can definitely hear a Little Richard influence in in Robert Plant's vocals all over the place. Mm-hmm. I think the way he croons oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, whines like, and yeah. all that. I mean, I think he's it definitely goes back to say that you know these guys were listening to a lot of that early stuff. I mean, they they were obviously influenced by the early blues because they ripped off most of it. So I mean, that's. <laughs> They're I mean, accusing a lot of that. We'll get into that later too. But <laughs> we're I mean, going to yeah. get letters. One of the great rock and roll bands of all time, but I mean, they lifted a few ideas here and there, you know. Fake it till you make it. You know? uh, Doc Gino who, 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 is, who is Doc Gino is watching. Chris Thunderwolf Dotson, what's up, guys? We are talking about some Led Zeppelin. What is your Doc Chris? What are your favorite tracks on Zozo Led Zeppelin Four? Let us know. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. Um, let's get to the next song on uh, this amazing record. There's not a lot of songs on this record. What is it? Seven, eight, eight. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're no, we haven't rounded outside one yet. Uh, for you kids out there, records used to be actual <laughs> vinyl LPs, and there was a side one and a side two. So we're we're we we're not done with side one yet. We're going to get there in a minute. But let's talk about the next song, Lily. What is it? The Battle of Evermore. Folk song sung by Robert Plant and Sandy Denny, who was in the British folk rock band Fairport Convention. Um, It's acoustic guitar and mandolin. Uh, Page said in 1977, the Battle of Evermore was made up on the spot uh, by Plant and himself. He picked up John Paul Jones' mandolin, because magically, he just knows how to do everything. Never having played a mandolin before and just wrote up the chords and the whole thing in one sitting. And it does make references to uh, The Lord of the Rings. Yes, uh, 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 Robert Plant was a huge Lord of the Rings fan. You can see uh, that in a lot of photographs yeah, with him. Yeah, too. he's really, was, was, we're really into it. And um, uh, what's, her, what's her name? De- Denny? What was her name? Sandy Denny. Sandy Denny. Sandy Denny, yeah. Yeah, she's like, doing the, like, the call and response with him on Ooh. that. And it's mm-hmm. really amazing. And I again, I learned something. I did not know that. I thought that was he had gone back and just overdubbed. Or Literally, something. I thought it was just him. Yeah. Till I read it, yeah, <laughs> I, I did. And now, and then when I re-listened to it tonight, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. you can definitely, you can definitely tell that, it, that that's a different vocalist there. Keith, anything you want to talk about? Battle of Evermore. That's a great stripped down song. I mean, I've seen the, you know, they've they've done a version with uh, when it was the Page and Plant. Uh, remember, they were doing the uh, what was the Unleaded. Yeah, they did a cool, a cool version of them. A lot of percussion. Uh, some, you know, I don't think it was Sandy Denny on that. He had an Indian girl come out and do it on that one. So it was Madonna. like Madonna. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those ones that just kind of stands. You know, more of a stripped down thing. I I don't know. Like I guess when you're, you know, thinking about the whole Zeppelin catalog, it sounds like something that should have been on Led Zeppelin three. To be honest with you, maybe it was a leftover track. I don't know the history of the track itself, but. Led Zeppelin three was a lot more acoustic based. They had some rockers on that one, but there was a lot of. I mean, there was a lot of tunes on Led Zeppelin three. They even sounded a little bit country tinged, to be honest with you. So when they came out for like Led Zeppelin four, I mean, they definitely this are definitely a rock and roll album. But this is one of them songs that's kind of just one of those. I want to. I hate. Like I said, I hate to call it a filler, but on this album, it almost is. You know, it's just a good song, but it's not. You know. I wouldn't consider it the best song on the album. It's a fine song, don't get me wrong. But so, so we're already going to say that this is probably uh, on Keith. When we rank the tracks, this is going to be the, la- the, the 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 last one for Keith. 
It is not, actually, but <laughs> we'll just keep on going. <laughs> oh, oh, my. Um, I, uh, I know some people that, I, I know two people that have said that they want this song played at their funeral. The Battle of Evermore. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I think it does, too. I think I think it's a, it's a kind of a cool request. Um, but, yeah. Um, great song. Unusual. Different. And I think that this... But I, here's here's what I... What, what it really amazes me about this record. And a lot of records from this area... Area. Era. <laughs> um, who's Next. There's a lot of records from this early 70s era where the band, you could tell, put a lot of thought into... The songs that were going to be on the album, the songs that weren't going, because there are songs that were written that did not make the album. Mm -hmm. Um, And the order and the sort of flow, we bust out hard, man, with Black Dog, right? Yeah. And then we get into some in your face, straight up rock and roll. And then we bring it in completely down for Battle of Evermore. We go in a completely, um, we go in a completely different, um, different direction for Battle of Evermore. And. So it's almost like navigating a live track. I mean, a live show. I yeah. Mean, you just, you come out, usually in a live show, nobody opens with a freaking ballad. It's kind of, you come out swinging, and then you kind of chill it out a little bit at the third, fourth song, and you bring it back up again, and it's got its ebbs and flows. But, I mean, like, at albums are probably, you know, a lot of times, I think bands re- are representative of like, their live show. They will come out kicking kicking your ass, and you got to sit down a little bit. The lighters come out. we got some, you know, laid-back stuff, and then we're going to go crank it up again. So, yeah, this is one of them little... More down moments in the album, that's all. Um, And I think that this is a great setup for what comes next. (laughs) And I think that, um, you know, (laughs) this is a song, right, that sort of kind of defines classic rock. Everybody knows. I mean, this is the song, when somebody says classic rock, this is the song that everybody, oh, and what is the song, Lily? Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven! (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Jinsky, Stairway to Heaven! (laughs) One of the most popular songs of all time. Three se- There's three sections to the song, each progressively increasing in tempo and volume. Voted number three in the in 2000 by VH1 on its list of 100 greatest rock songs. I wish I would have checked to see what was number one, but I did not. Um, basically, it's about a woman who took everything without giving anything back. It's the standout track on the album. Was played on FM radio stations frequently, but they did not release it as a single. Hmm. Which is interesting. And um, it is the centerpiece of the group's live set from 1971 on. So everybody loves the song. Everybody knows this song, recognizes it. If you don't, please get off the podcast because you're too young to be watching this. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, Just to digress for half a second, uh, I believe, and I could be wrong, Keith, maybe you know, I believe that Led Zeppelin only ever released one single, and that was Whole Lot of Love. I believe I could be wrong. I don't know. Che- you guys can check me on that, um, and because there was a scandal about it, because the record label took out the um, interlude there with the drums, mm-hmm. and it just goes right into the guitar solo. And there was a, they released a, a at the time, guys. It was a forty-five uh, RPM with was called a single would come out of songs that you know were on a band's album. They would release. It. They would literally nowadays you say release a single. We just mean that, like, they put that out and he gets on the radio. Yeah. But it was literally released as when they, somebody says released a single, that means it came out as a uh, on a, a forty five. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stairway to Heaven was probably too long, anyways, to be on a on a um, forty five. Um, Keith, any do you want to get into this or where, where do you want to go with this? Because there's a lot to talk about on Stairway. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, just an iconic rock and roll song. I mean, it's a staple of any classic rock. Uh, radio station. I mean, it's kind of one of them songs where even if you don't like rock and roll, you've heard this song somewhere, even just by accident. I mean, it's 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 up there with any the Freebirds and the freaking you know any other song you want to name that's you know an iconic rock and roll song. I mean, it's just it's been played more times than it probably should. I mean, it's it's a great song. It's one of them songs I think that gets played probably you, you, you when you hear it. You know, it's maybe played too much at times. You know, it's like you hear it. You hear it quite a bit, but I mean, it's and it's a it's a long song, which is amazing for even that time. It was a little bit more forgiving with you know radio airplay. Today, is, you know, nobody has the attention span for it. So this song like that would never get released as a single today. They'd probably tell you not even to release it. But uh, what is the clock in? In some eight freaking minutes, some in some change. I mean, it's it's got some uh, it's 
got some length to it. It's like, you know, and nowadays it's like two songs in one, you know? So it's, and it definitely goes through some mood changes. It's a brilliant song. It's well written. It's, uh, like I said, it's just one of those songs that just stand the test of time. Um, it's eight minutes, two seconds. There you um, go. The what you hear on the on the radio or on the on, on the on the album is pretty much for the most part the band's second take. And one of the reasons why Bonham's drums are so vicious and he plays it blah, 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 all those big fills mm-hmm. at the end, on the outro is because he was pissed because they recorded it once and everybody thought it was great, but Jimmy Page said, <laughs> "I think we could do a little better." And um, Bonham didn't want to play it again. So when he comes in, um, when it goes from the, uh, by the way, there's it's it's got a uh, interesting key shift in it. It starts out in a Aeolian mode and goes to uh, A minor Dorian. Um, but when it gets to the Dorian section, when the drums kick in, that's one of the reasons why Bonham sounds so freaking vicious is because he's pissed the f off. <laughs> that he's got to play this whole damn song again. It was probably he, oh, probably, he probably has you know. He- he probably yeah, was licking, his, licking his lips. He had a freaking drink probably set up for him at the bar in a <laughs> hotel somewhere. I don't know. But, you know, it's just, he, he was definitely, he was probably, hopefully he stayed sober for the recording sessions. You never know. But, I mean, <laughs> yeah, when he comes in, it is vicious. And it's a it's a very, John Bonham, he does put his John Bonham triplet licks in there. That's just, you know, it's, that's his thing. And, it you know, it, when he comes in, the drums don't come in until it's very dumb towards the end of the song. I mean, but then when they come in, they make their, they make a statement. Um. The song was, uh, the uh, Robert Plant wrote the lyrics and he kept the words. He wanted to kind of like tweak your imagination, you know, kind of put images in your mind, but he didn't want to be too specific because he wanted this to be a song that allowed people to kind of fill in their own story of the song um, as opposed to something that was so literal that, um, you know, it would only have one interpretation. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of breakdown on the, on the lyrics here because I love lyrics. Um. Uh, it has it, it, uh, Robert Plant is all, as I said earlier has allowed it to come up to different interpretations. But the first verse is based on the tale, according to Robert Plant, of a materialistic and selfish woman. It is clear that this individual equates heaven (air quotes here) with shopping. Mm. L- Lily, I only, I only do you. online shopping. I'm kidding you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, that was a sexist comment. I, Lord, I apologize. And apparently, even if the stores are closed, she can still get access to what she came for with a word, so to speak, insinuating that she's so powerful and wealthy that with just a phone call, the shops will be open for Lily. Um, just teasing you. Just a little flash of a boob. <laughs> just a little flash of boob. Uh, the second <laughs> verse uh, is based on plant envisioning the West. Apparently being destroyed by rings of smoke that are visible through the trees. Again, this is something that is occurring only in his thoughts, but still his spirit is, quote unquote, crying for leaving. What geographical region plant considers the West is unspecified, with some even putting theories that this refers to the Wild West, you know, like the Old West. But considering that the song was written in England, the implication would be somewhere west of the United Kingdom. This verse is climaxed by the group of people who, quote unquote, stand as a witness to this fire. Okay, this is just one interpretation, guys. This guy's taking some of the... uh, some of what Robert has said about the song and kind of filling in some gaps for us. Verse 3, apparently the same people are referred to in the third verse as those who stand long. The story being told in this section is that if these individuals have a mutual desire, the piper will lead them to reason. And instead of the trees burning now, the forest will echo with laughter. Uh, it is never specified who the piper actually is, uh, though all things considered, it definitely plays out as a maybe religious reference. Maybe. Um, I thought I, my opinion is the piper was always just music. Mm-hmm. Calling us out to like you, you know, to open your mind. Uh, the beginning of the fourth verse brings up the character of the May Queen, and accordingly is all about fertility and the advent of spring. Later, the concept of heaven is again brought up, though uh, 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 though implicitly, as in people having a choice to choose between two paths um, up on which to tread. Once again, the piper is present, this time someone who is calling you to join him. Um, 
as in follow the same path that he is on. In all honesty, Stairway to Heaven plays out more or less like a gospel track in some ways, admonishing the listener to represent, uh, to repent, excuse me, as in choose the road, which leads to, you know, uh, uh, a lady we all know who shines white light. However, don't expect Led Zeppelin to acknowledge this. Instead, when pressed on the song's explanation, they often give answers which are difficult to derive any definitive meaning from. And, I, and, and like I said, I believe that was uh, in, uh, intentional. Um, on the idea of the song uh, by T- uh, Spirit uh, being stolen, Led Zeppelin have been accused of stealing parts of the song, Taurus by the band Spirit, and using it to his Stairway to Heaven. And indeed, when you listen to the beginning of Stairway to Heaven, it sounds remarkably similar to part of Spirit's song. The case went to court, and I believe it was not awarded to Spirit. So... There you have it. Um, the other thing that's interesting about Stairway to Heaven is this is not the only song named Spirit, Stairway to Heaven. It's not the first song, by the way, named Stairway to Heaven. Neil Sedaka had a song called Stairway to Heaven. No relation. No, no nothing, you know. Nothing similar. No, no, no nothing similar. So, um, but... I don't like yeah. his version. What was that? I don't like his version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Jimmy Page was very concerned about small details throughout the whole... Uh, album the the record the uh, beginning uh is a uh, bass recorder playing that it's not flute it's bass it's bass recorder just a little bit of trivia there for you guys um about the song so um any uh any more comments anything you guys want to talk about stairway to heaven before we move on uh, i have nothing else okay so again kids what do we do we Turn the album over. over. <laughs> and what happens when we turn the album over, Lily? We turn it over to listen to Misty Mountain Hop. Released as the B-side to Black Dog and performed... Actually, yes, Black Dog was released as a single. That answers your question. Okay. <laughs> uh, performed in most of the band's 72 and 73 concert tours. Most common interpretation of the song's title involves a reference to um, the Misty Mountains in Tolkien's The Hobbit. The lyrics refer to events of the July 7, 68 legalized pot rally in Hyde Park, London, in which police made arrests for marijuana possession. Uh, yeah, the song is about partying, no yeah. doubt. It's about, yeah. it's about, the, yeah, yeah, they're, they, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The mist, the, you know what the mist is. You don't have to think too hard on that. Uh, Keith, yeah. you're, uh, uh, you ever played Misty Mountain Hop in a band? I don't think so. I would like to, but, you know, I'll play it, I'll play it over here by myself, but yeah. <laughs> You Here's to... one thing about that song, not to get yeah. all drum nerd on you, but no, that, go this for song, it. this song, Joe Bottom plays fills in this song that he don't play like in a like he's more a lot more controlled in a lot of songs where his fills are like I don't want to you know it's simplistic but they're dynamic and for the song this song here it sounds like he's going for it on that take man I mean he's like doing a lot of like very I'm just reckless abandon sort of fills where he's playing a lot busier than his normal sort of fills would be. You know, so that, if you listen to the drum fills on the song that come up through, like, you know, all, in all the breaks, he starts out with some simple, like, you know, simple things. But then as the song builds, he plays a lot more faster, intricate things during the breaks, and which is not something I hear him do all the time, you know, so... Uh, we, we, you're going to hear a lot of talk about John Bonham, guys, uh, tonight. <laughs> Because it's just such an amazing musician, and this is what such a great um, record, if you will, of what he could do as a drummer uh, in in a lot of ways. Um, have you ever um, did wh- what Led Zeppelin songs have you played in bands, Keith? You've had to play Black Dog. It can, no, I never played Black Dog. Really? It's too hard to get together. It doesn't sound tight ever, man. It's very there's like two there's like two sound signatures going on at the same time in that song. If you check that out, there's like four, four, and five going on at the same time. That's why there's like an overlap in the feel. It's weird. I mean, it's definitely something you have to do a lot of counting on, you know? So <laughs> I've never really done that one. I've done uh, definitely The Ocean. I've played The Ocean many times. I've played um, uh, Communication Breakdown a shit ton of times. Yeah. Good bands. Uh, it's a good one. I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, uh, some parts of like a whole lot of love, but you wouldn't do the middle. That's too like. Studio yeah, you just go right thing. to the you go right to the yeah, um, solo, yeah. The single version. <laughs> yeah, I've done like stuff like when the levy breaks. I've done like like 
a lot of like you know, segues in the songs where you do like mashups and stuff where you have like parts of like Stairway to Heaven. Or, I mean, I've also played like uh, try to do you know uh, rock and roll. I've done rock and roll a bunch of times. I mean, but it's you know that's songs that are you know I would like to do that are probably more obscure. But I mean, it's neither here nor there. We no maybe, maybe someday you know. <laughs> Um, I have performed um, Black Dog, Rock and Roll, Misty Mountain Hop, um, The Ocean. Um, yeah, I've ne- done that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, Black Dog was a signature song in my last band. We 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 did a, we did a really good version of that. Um, Always fun to play, but always it was well, the reason they're fun to play is because they're challenging to get together. Rock and roll is always is always a freaking mess. You're right, um, and I never played. I'll that. say Black Dog. Black Dog's harder to play than that. I think rock and roll. Well, as long as the drummer can play the intro, I mean, it doesn't. You can bullshit your way through the end because it starts with great drums, ends with great drums, and it's pretty so It's just solid groove in between, and the drummer can bullshit his way through the end of it. If you f up at beginning as a drummer, you're dead. De- Song's gonna suck ass the rest of the time. Yeah, it it you really have to be together on it because I mean I've done it like at a lot of jam nights. That's why I haven't I didn't actually play it any band, but done it a lot of jam nights. And oh yeah, it, yeah. I, I I never liked doing it. I you know that could be that could be a nightmare because I mean if it doesn't come in right, it just kind of falls off the rail. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. The piece of shit out there. Yeah, go. yeah. It just turns into like a really cheesy like blues jam is what it turns into. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, I've performed none of the songs. Really, what songs have you played live, Lily? None. None. <laughs> no quarter. Uh, no quarter. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, next is four sticks. Uh, the title reflects drummer uh, John Bottom's <laughs> performance with two sets of drumsticks totaling four. I don't know why. I wrote it that way. Uh, the track was difficult to record compared to the other material on the album. It took many, many takes to finally get it right. This Maybe that's why Bonham was actually... <laughs> um, it was played live only once by Zeppelin and re-recorded with the Bombay Symphony Orchestra in 1972. It was reworked for Page and Plant's 1994 album No Quarter. Uh, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant unleaded as well. So That's when they played it the best, to be honest with you. And that wasn't even with John Bonham. That's the one guy that did Bonham some friggin' justice, and I'd hate to say this about Jason Bonham, who's a great player in his own right. If you ever watch the No Quarter thing live yeah. with Michael Lee playing drums, Michael Lee was the best impressionist of John Bonham. He sounds exactly like him. That dude had every friggin' lick. He had every he had the drum sound down. He had that guy is like needs to be more like touted than he is because Michael Lee killed that shit i mean he sounded just like john bonham to the point where i was like i don't know what they did here they just like overdubbed bonham shit on top of it but no he just knocked that shit out of the park he sounds great on all those tracks and he did four sticks and killed it and he does anything any zeppelin that he did that was the best interpretation i've heard of john bonham everybody does a bonham impression i mean i've heard brian tishy and like a lot of guys do it well but i mean it's the Michael Lee, man, has that. He had the, the all the the sounds, the licks, all the grooves down. I mean, just the, the drum sounded exactly like his. I mean, it's it was that's impressive to get all that like little details down. But he, yeah, he nails that stuff. So that's I mean, we're talking about somebody that's you know trying to mimic a legend. I mean, he did an A plus job on that. Um, that uh, you and I have had this conversation before, again over drinks. <laughs> and uh, something course. from something from that no quarters came up on YouTube where we were hanging out, and you and um, I know you were really impressed. That I, I could not remember the guy's name that played the drums on that, um, but yeah, it's great, and that that is one of the coolest. Things. A lot of people kind of bemoan the fact, well, they never got back together and toured, blah blah blah. But they did that thing, and they also did the page plant thing, which I think. It that, was amazing. Yeah, and they sounded good. They were both like really in good form. They where they weren't like too old to sing the songs. Right. Or they just they still rocked hard. And the Page Plant album is a um, that they did. Um, what was that called? Um, I have it in damn. Uh, what's, what's it called? called. Help, bring, bring, let's check that out. Let's get that right. But um, that's a that's a great record. I don't remember yeah, that either. That's man. A, that's just... a really good like you know kind of like this is us in the nineties. 
you know, 20 years later, and they're like, they, they sound great. And you could hear... Walking you, into Clarksdale. That's right, walking into Clarksdale. That's the, that's the tour I went and saw. Yes. But they played all Zeppelin songs. Yeah, yeah, they, do a lot, yeah, they did all the Zeppelin songs. <laughs> but you can hear, when they did that record, you heard where a lot of the uh, post-grunge bands were really influenced by Led Zeppelin. So you could kind of hear... Um, do you have it like in front of you who rhythm, who, who, the rhythm section that was in that one on tour? Uh, Jason Bonham yep. was on. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. He was then. at, the, I mean, at least at the Civic Arena. That's where he was. I don't know if they changed up drummers per. It never says that who, who was the bass player or anything, and it wasn't John Paul. I don't remember. Joe Schmo. Who that was. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, shout out to Beth Petternell, uh, Luke Balcom. Luke won the guitar, and Luke, I shipped it today, buddy. It's on its way to you, and I packed that sucker up tight. So tight, 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 tight. <laughs> so like I hope this. That, so uh, you got to post some pictures of you playing it or, le- or, <laughs> or checking it out when you uh, when you get. I put a little note in there for you too. Uh, so congratulations, Luke. Uh, but Bill Damiano is here as well. We love you, Bill. Um, so. Bill. Always a Bill. There's uh, always, there's a, always bill a Bill going on with yeah. me. No, 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 uh, no, Billy Altman tonight, but. Build up what? Uh, uh, past build, the old build bedtime. Maybe maybe passed out. You know, it's a tough day at the old grind. I guess. <laughs> What's what happened after Four Sticks, Lily? Uh, going to California happened after that, which is one of my top favorite Zeppelin songs of all time. Uh, song started out about um, song started out as a song about Californian earthquakes. Uh, then Jimmy Page, Andy Johns, and Peter Grant traveled to L.A. to mix Led Zeppelin Four. They actually experienced a minor earthquake. Um, and that's when they changed the title. Plant. Um, it was gu- Guide to California first. Sorry, that's probably important to say. Uh, Plant <laughs> stated that the song might like, be... We something. Something's right. been left out. <laughs> Plant stated that the song might be a bit embarrassing at times lyrically, but it did sum up a period of his life at the age of 22. Um, it, it was inspired by Joni Mitchell because they were super huge fans of hers. Um, yeah, that's it. That is it. Yeah. And it was well, Guide they, to you California. Think they, you think he was slipping to the old Led Zeppelin? I don't know. What do you think, Keith? Well, I mean, I, that's that's none of my business and probably none of yours, but the whole other thing where it's like that's that, that, that song was definitely inspired, you know, so much lyrically and the vibe of the whole song was definitely inspired by Joni Mitchell because he really was digging on her at the time. Maybe he was giving her the old Robert. I don't know. The old plan. Um, that, I, I forgot. Plant. He was giving her each plant and one in her. He was planting her. Um, what's, the, what's the meme? Robert plants while Roger waters. Yes, I think that's so <laughs> funny. I lose it every time um, I see that. But uh, uh, Going to California is a song I've done as well in bands. I uh, love this song. Um, both times, with uh, every time I've done it, it's been with female singers. Um, the, speaking of female singers, and I will get right off of this real quick, there's a band called Never the Bride. They did one album, and they do a cover of Going to California, and it is jaw-droppingly amazing. This woman has this unbelievable voice. She's uh-huh. like, she's like, she's like Melissa Etheridge meets Linda Perry, like, mm. just insane. Like, really, if you never che- heard it, check it out. Never the Bride doing uh, going to California. What happens after going to, after we go to California? That levy breaks. The levy so. breaks. And I've been <laughs> wanting to get to, to this. When the levy breaks. Um, Country blues song written first and first recorded by Kansas Joe McCoy. Uh, and Memphis Mini in 1929. The lyrics are talking about the experience during the upheaval caused by the Great Mississippi Flood in, the, in 27. It was reworked by Zeppelin as the last song on this album. Uh, he used Plant used many of the original lyrics, and songwriting is credited to Memphis Mini and the individual members of Led Zeppelin. Many other artists have performed, performed and recorded versions of this song. And, of course, the track opens with Bonham's heavy, unaccompanied drumming, which actually was co- recorded in the lobby of Headley Grange That's because right. that was the best place for this sort of drumming that he wanted to get accomplished. Uh, apparently, he tried other places in the area, and this, this was the best for him. So. Um, Keith, you're up. No? You want, you, want to tell talk you. About, you want to say nothing about it? You're just like, you want me to tell you it's the best effing rock and roll groove ever laid down on a track <laughs> anywhere. Fight, fight me if you want to because this is the best... <laughs> Rock and roll groove of all time. It's uh, I had it as my ringtone on my phone at one point, just because. And I would not even answer the phone ever. I would just let it go. <laughs> go, go. That's great. And of course, it was like no matter who was calling, calling for a minute. That shit was just bumping the whole time, man. I could care less. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it was definitely recorded like how Lily said. It's just one of those things where that's what he he was vibing off that big big sound in the 
in the microphones in the hallway and the you know everything just get that big drum sound i mean it's hard to duplicate that sound and probably never never again will anybody do it it's just one of them the groove like like i said is the groove you know super complex to play no but it just sounds amazing because that's why are i argue with a lot of buttheads sometimes <laughs> oh it's not hard to play well do give us a flat well, go ahead and play it's it awesome <laughs> Aaron Wolf uh, chimed in with walking to, into Clarksdale. Thank you, buddy. Thanks Thank for you, helping Aaron. us out with our brain fart. Uh, Chris Thunderwolf Dodson wants to hear Keith play. Uh, play. He wants you to post a video of you playing Moby Dick, which is not on Led Zeppelin Four. But uh, so I would have to, the hand part. I have to get my hands. I'd wear some gloves, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Um, something about this song that I think a lot of people don't realize, and this I had I heard heard this before, but was reminded of it while doing my research today, is this song was recorded at a faster tempo and then slowed down to give it that bigger, yeah, heavier, they that heavy. Th- yeah, yeah. Um, so some very cool studio tricks uh, view, uh, done on this. The um, Every, I believe the only person that sang it in time was Robert Plant. Yeah, that's his vocal. He, he sang it. In, he yet, sang it. It was all slowed down. Yeah, but at that point he had sang. So now check this out, though. So the harmonica—that's Robert Plant playing the harmonica. He played the harmonica backwards. It was they—they they played it backwards, and then when you run it forwards because they put echo on it, you hear the echo coming on before. The note of the harmonica starts. You hear the echoed note first. Um, these were like studio tricks that they probably picked up. Uh, probably Jimmy Page had picked because he was a studio musician. Actually, so was uh, John Paul Jones. They were both studio musicians that he had probably picked up on, you know, uh, over the years of being a studio musician. But um, all, that all kind of goes into making this such a, such a special sounding thing. And it is an amazing album ender. I mean, it's just like you almost kind of feel like when that when it ends, like really, I waited like you like it was kind of like they like saved their kind of best shit for last. Or something. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like this is like kind of the greatest thing on here, maybe. I had to uh, I had to go back and check out the track listing because I forgot that one was last. To be honest with you, I thought they stuck out in the middle somewhere. It's been a while since I looked at like, listened to the album. Uh, I'm gonna probably have to listen to it again, but I mean, I'm just going off the ball. The memory of it and just i've listened to it so many times that it really didn't even jot down that many notes i'm learning a lot of things tonight from y'all doing your Did, you know, can, research I ask you, can i ask you a question as a, and if it, you we, have to we, yeah we, we, we glossed we, gl- we glossed over this quickly uh four sticks and i know i asked you about this before but I, we were wasted and i don't remember um Exactly. What did he do? Did he just hold the two sticks at the same time, and so he got like a kind of like flaming kind of thing going on? What, what? I wasn't really there, Lou, but I mean, I would ah. guess that's what it is. Listen, not, not to be a smart ass, but that's like it's the same. It's the same trick that uh, Steve Gadd used in uh, "Late in the Evening" by Paul Simon, and that's why it gets that flammy kind of like okay. overlapping sound because there's you know it's not a dub, double track or anything. It's someone playing with two sticks in each hand. Which is going? They're not going to, you know, work out the same way as if you have obviously one in each hand. You're going to get a flaming kind of sound that is what if that's what you're going for. And a lot of times, where Steve Gow was playing the more of the Afro, the African pattern he was playing in that song, Bonham was going for that, you know, sound too. I probably think Bonham was probably a little ahead of the curve of that. But I mean, it's you know, I don't know exactly what year Late in the Evening came out, but I'm sure I'm assuming that Bonham that came out in '71. I'm sure Bonham was probably doing that i don't know i'm not going to say first but he that's a definitely an interesting idea that he had going on there um a couple other things that i wanted to kind of touch on about the, about this do you have the info on the symbols or do you want me to go over that I, I do have that. i do have that so let's talk about the symbol because they each pick their own symbols because well first of all and, and i it would literally touched on this when she gave the intro to the album but there was a real issue the critics critics were all over them. those of you who got my email today i talked a little bit about this in my email um the, yep there you are there's bottom symbol there it is uh, <laughs> yeah, that's called the bro uh bromian rings that's what that's called um right. but the critics were all over them saying oh you know it's all hype you know they've got a lot of money behind their promotion that's the only reason why they're doing well blah, 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 blah. so uh they decided well look we're not even going to put our name on the album and you know it's kind of a middle finger huh yeah and they said they they said they felt bad because they, they the record label was like really nervous about this 
Um, but they were like, we, you know, and it turns out it was their best album. They didn't even put the freaking name on it, and it became the one of the greatest albums of all time. Um, but go ahead and talk about the um, uh, each symbol. Yeah. Okay, so Jimmy Page um, designed his own symbol. Never gave any reasoning behind it. Um, it's argued that his symbol appeared as an early. As early as 1557 to represent Saturn, the symbol sometimes referred to as Zoso, though Page has explained that it was not, in fact, intended to be a word at all. People just came up with that, which is kind of cool. Um, it's like the S on Superman's yeah. chest. That's not really an S. Yeah. It's just a symbol, <laughs> not an S, but go ahead. Um, Jones symbol, he chose from Rudolf Koch's book, Book of Signs, and it's a single circle intersecting three Vesia Vesica Pisces. I always say that wrong. It is intended to symbolize a person who possesses both confidence and competence. Uh, it's called the Celtic knot, right? I, they call it a triketra. Tri okay. Uh, bottom symbol, the three interlocking uh, rings, were was picked by the drummer from the same book. It, was at, it represents the triad of mother, father, and child, but inverted, it also happens to be the logo for Valentine beer. Yeah, I, yeah, I was <laughs> waiting for you to bring that up. Uh, plant symbol is a feather within a circle. Uh, was his own design, being based on the sign of the supposed Mu or Mu civilization. But there's a fifth symbol. Oh yeah, well, what's yeah. her name has her own symbol. That's yeah. right. Sandy Denny has her own symbol. Um, since she contributed to the Battle of Evermore, um, it's three equilateral triangles uh, appearing on the inner sleeve of the LP, serving as an asterisk. So. Um, and from what I understand, that has something to do with the, uh, a symbol of the Godhead. I don't have that. From, from the Kabbalah or something like okay. that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I, that, that's what I had learned about that. Um, let's talk a little wee bit about the album art. Um, the, the, the painting with the guy with the stick, that's a painting. I thought for a long time ago, for a long time it was a photo. But it's an oil painting. And they found that when they went to Headley Grange, they had taken a day and went to an antique shop like somewhere in the village or whatever nearby. And um, Jimmy Page fell in love with that painting. Uh, he thought that it, re it reminded him of uh, George um, uh, Pickengill, who was the father of... Of modern witchcraft, mm. uh, but but uh, he also thought it resembled uh, the ten of ones tarot card, which is a guy holding a bunch of uh, sticks like that. Uh, the fold out art is based on the hermit tarot card, and was, they felt it was a symbol of their sort of journey to kind of like um, you know going from the beginning to like kind of hitting their 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 pinnacle here. Um, one more thing, I just want to kind of add about this album is that. While a lot of people argue that this is their like greatest record, a lot of other people will say no physical graffiti, and so we should probably do an, a show maybe next year uh, on sometime. We should work on do it do a show on physical graffiti because it, that well, is well, an amazing. Man, that, that's so, I would probably think that John Bonham's best shit was probably on physical graffiti, but at the same time, if you realize that physical graffiti is actually a double album, there's a lot more songs on physical graffiti. Oh yeah, yeah, so. yeah. There's a lot yeah. more to choose from. I mean, if I had to choose between the two of them, yeah, I wouldn't want to have to even deal with that. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, another thing, that I want to mention one more thing that uh, I keep... This, this, this record is so great. There's so many things about it. But um, there were things that were recorded for this that did not make it out until Physical Graffiti. Like, there was an early version of No Quarter that was uh, recorded during these sessions. That's why I told you guys, like... Part of these, this is when a band would decide what songs go in, what songs go out, what because they're trying to make a whole statement. And this record is so cohesive; it's like watching a great movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a journey it takes you on, and it's amazing how they end the first side, then they come back in on the second side. But down by the seaside was written and recorded uh, during this time, and as well as because Ian Stewart played on Black Dog Boogie with Stu. Um, so. Just a kind of a few more tidbits that you may have not known about Led Zeppelin um, 4, uh, a.k.a. Zozo. So what do you think, guys? Do you guys like this record? I do. <laughs> that's pretty uh, It's pretty, so it's that's pretty, right. okay it's pretty record, solid. Man. I mean, it's, you know, if I had to pick, I mean, I would say that, you know, I was telling you before about the, uh, one of the, I think it was a modern drummer poll or something that said this was, and, you know, poll taken, all drummers thought that it was like almost 40% that this was the best Bonzo record. So, I mean, it's, you know, if you're talking about just drummers from a drummer standpoint, then, you know, that's this is this one's high up on the drumming food chain with drummers because that's definitely the best uh, 
John Bonham record or Led Zeppelin record there is, you know, Bonham wise. They said it was his, his best, his best material on here. But I don't know if I wholeheartedly agree. But it was, it's a great record. You don't know if you wholeheartedly agree, but it was a great record. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there's some songs on Physical Graffiti that are pretty badass too. So, I mean, a couple. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a great, um, um, unauthorized. If you guys have Amazon Prime. Um, there is a great, um, I cannot find the website I want, Lily, for, for events in 1971. I don't want to know every event. I just want to know the highlights. So I'm losing my mind here. Um, there on, on Amazon Prime, excuse me, there is a, uh, like an unauthorized, uh, documentary about physical graffiti. Uh, so if you guys want to know more about that record, you guys can, um, Check that out. It's. Uh, I started watching that one, and I just. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of like it. British rock critics and stuff. Like, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not a. Uh, it's kind know, of just. It, it, I don't know. I'd have to watch it again. I didn't really even make it through the whole thing. It just kind of was. To be honest, but you kind of just sat there for a while. Yeah, like, I mean, you know. Um. Uh, in 1971, some other things happened. Uh, it did. Yes. Oh. Uh, in 1971, some legendary rock bands were actually formed. So while Led Zeppelin was kind of hitting their stride, one of the uh, bands that was formed was the Eagles. Foghat, Roxy Music, and the New York Dolls were all formed uh, in 1971. Thank God for that, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> the first ever email was sent. <laughs> Rolls- 1971? Yep. 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 Uh, Rolls Royce went bankrupt in 1971. Apollo 14 landed. I wonder why. I wonder why. And Apollo 14 landed on the moon. Evil Knievel set a world record. The infamous uh, daredevil jumped over 19 cars. He did this with a Harley Davidson XR750 motorcycle at a raceway in California. He held on to this record for 28 years. Uh, 1971 saw the end of the Ed Sullivan show. Of the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, oh yeah. Jim Morrison died in 1971. Lead singer of The Doors. Four countries gained independence, and the People's Republic of China was admitted to the General Assembly of the United Nations. Some people feel to this day feels that might have been a uh, mistake. Uh, Charles Manson and his and three of his followers were convicted. Starbucks opened their first store in 1971. Um, Idi Amin <laughs> became president of Uganda. You guys can read that for yourself. Uh, Walt Disney World was Yay. open in Florida. Uh, and the Soviet Union launched the first space station into orbit. Okay, so there you are. There's some guys. tidbits. Yeah, just a few tidbits. Um, we are recording this on what date? We are recording this on October 13th. And, oh, we ca- I can't resist. Let's jump over and see what else happened on October th- uh, 13th. Uh, 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 Don Everly was born. The Who recorded My Generation. The Rolling Stones started a four-week four run, uh, number one, uh, with the album Goat's Head Soup. Ooh. TV host Ed Sullivan died. That's why the Ed Sullivan show was canceled. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that usually, that'll put a damper on shit, you know? <sighs> oh, John Ford Coley was born. Sammy Hagar. Happy birthday, Sammy Hagar. 1947. He's an old man. Yeah, but he don't look old. <laughs> He's doing all right. <laughs> Uh, one Think of, about this: Him and Bill Clinton are the same age. <laughs> um, and, what does that uh, tell you? One That's of, hard uh, living there, boy. One of uh, one of Keith's favorite musicians. Oh, I'm sorry, that is not Keith's favorite musician. Never mind. Oh, I Who? will just skip that. We'll talk about that later. Um, but pretty much, guys. Oh, and Michael Jackson went to number one on the U.S. charts uh, in 1971 with "Don't Stop Till You Get Enough." I love that. I roller skated. I danced that. to that. <laughs> Regatta de Blanc, the second album for the Police, was uh, started a four week run at number one. A lot of people forget that like Regatta de Blanc was a big record for them. People people forget about that. Um, Wait, reggae. Yeah, 
Yeah, great great record, great record. So anyway, so just a few tidbits there. You guys have been listening to Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. I got to say, really, I got to give a shout out to my bro, Chris Thunderwolf Dodson at Wolf's Customs. You want to go to wolfscustoms.online. No sense, guys, getting out there and playing. You know, gigs start happening again maybe maybe next year. You want to get out there with a guitar that looks badass. You want to get attention. You know, folks are going to be looking for something to catch their eye. You want to hook up with wolfscustoms.online, and they will make sure that you look good. Now, how you sound, that's kind of up to you, right? I mean, yeah. you got you got to like, you got to <laughs> practice. Like it ain't gonna like you know We're make not you gonna sound make you good. into Jimmy Page, right? Exactly, <laughs> um, or Eddie Van Halen. Um, so anyway, so I want to share that with you guys. Can go to lulombardirocks.com to get more information. That's how Luke won that cool guitar. So um, just saying, just saying, <laughs> just saying. Uh, Lily, what's going on? I know Lily has her own show. I do have my own show. It's on Thursdays, Hot Licks with Lily Six on Rock Rage Radio. Go to rockrageradio.com. Or uh, just download the app. It's free. 6 p.m. Eastern Time. This is the week where I have Mark Weiss on, legendary rock photographer from the 80s. So you might want to listen in this Thursday for that interview. Super cool. Awesome, guys. And Keith the Hawk Hawkins, any final words, final thoughts, anything you'd like to tell anybody about? Want me to rank these tracks for you? Oh, shit. We forgot. Okay. And in conclusion, we're going to go with Keith. Keith is going to give us his ranking. Because we don't know, we're out of time. We don't have time to do them all. No, we, we don't have time to do, but we do it at the same time. No, like we'll do, no, we'll eight, do, no, 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 no. We'll do Keith's ranking because, because just because, because we forgot. It's on my, it's on my, it's on my birthday. Um, Happy birthday to Keith. Okay, number eight for me was Four Sticks. It's a great drumming song, but it's you know, it sounds hip. But it's number eight was just. A, I'm shocked. Agreed. Yeah, um, number seven for me was the Battle of Evermore. I think it's stripped down and Same. you know it's 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 it's, it's good. It just it's kind of one of I think it's a filler track my myself. Uh, six is going to California. It's stripped down once again. Yeah, it's kind of a mellow track. I wish it was whole album was just full of rock and roll masterpieces. But I've ever you know it's it, it's definitely uh, got that folky hippie vibe, which is probably not good for me. Um, <laughs> Five, number five, believe it or not, and I would probably take this one on the chin from a lot of people. Number five to me was Stairway to Heaven. Same. It's a great, it's a, it's an it's an iconic song, but it gets played so much that I don't want to effing hear it no more. Um, number four, if John Paul Jones is the unsung hero of Led Zeppelin. He probably doesn't get enough credit. The song starts with his great electric piano line, and just it, it goes from there. I think uh, he's a great musician. I think this band was just a the greatest rock and roll band. It's a great song, Misty Mountain Hot Number Four. Uh, Number three, believe it or not, for me, number three was one of Levy Breaks. Uh, the, the drum part is great, but it is a cover song, so I can't really give it all the credit in the world. I mean, yeah, it's the best rock and roll drum crew of all time, in my opinion. But, I mean, Memphis Mini, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's definitely different than her version, but it's, you. you know, it's one of them things. Number two, and like I said, at the beginning of the album is just, you know, it comes out swinging. Number two to me is, uh, is rock and roll, and the, the song that's Same. just... And starts and ends with great with a great drumming and number one to be in the best one probably maybe arguably one of the best Led Zeppelin songs ever is Black Dog man it's just it's just a great song and it's came out that album just comes out swinging and and that's that's the track that I think it, to, to me that track defines how Led Zeppelin when they want to rock really sound that's that's their sound Black okay. Dog is what they are that that's that's less Led Zeppelin to me that and a whole lot of love. Awesome. Um, I I really don't have too many issues with that. I would probably put Stairway to Heaven as number one. Um, I, I I know what you're saying about it being overplayed, but when you when you ha- I haven't I I got to say this. I was a giant Led Zeppelin fan, and then in the past year two years, I got heavily into Black Sabbath, and I sort of and this podcast doing this tonight re-energized my interest in Led Zeppelin again. I was like, oh, of course Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and um, I listened to the whole album like in order and when Stairway comes on, it feels like like an old friend. He like came over and is hanging out with you and you just, it just is such like you know, I can understand like as a one-off on the radio, you're like, "Oh, yawn, stare at heaven, please." But when you sit down to listen to the album and that comes on, yeah, I just think it's to me, it still rings as epic. But good picks, uh, Hawk. I appreciate it, brother. I just don't think people realize how versatile Led Zeppelin was. I mean, if you go through every album, and I mean, there's there's tracks on every album that you're like, "Man, that sounds a lot different than a lot of their other stuff." And I think that they 
they could come full on like just ripping her face off with some shredding guitar and big big ass drums then they can strip it down to like almost nothing and have just a very melodic folky type you know song at the same time and then have these like anthem rock songs too and then they've, they've dabbled in reggae middle eastern rhythms i mean odd time signatures there's everything going on in led zeppelin's catalog and i think yeah. that that's why to me they are the great band really amazing band yeah i mean i always said to me i've always said like led zeppelin is my beatles I was, you know, the, the, the Beatles were a little too early for me, but Led Zeppelin was like the band that, like, is kind of my touchstone. That I kind of look at Zeppelin as my Beatles, Sabbath as my Stones. That's yeah, I mean, opinion. that's just one of the things Rob always said, you know, Zeppelin and the Beatles are there, there, there. If, even if it's one and one A, I would give the nod to Zeppelin because I'm a music snob and Zeppelin are better musicians pound for pound, so I would just go with that. Um, okay, guys, there you have it from the mouth of the hawk. Black Dog, number one. Rock and Roll, number two. Battle of Evermore, number seven. Stairway to Heaven, number five. Misty Mountain, hop, number four. Four Sticks, eight. Going to gang, gang, California, six. And When the Levee Breaks is number three. Guys, have a great week. Check out Rock Rage Radio, rockrageradio.com. Lily V6, Keith the Hawk Hawkins, and my name is Lou Lombardi, a.k.a. Ludini. And we'll catch you guys all on the next Ludini Rock and Roll Circus.